Well, good morning, New Day. I am so glad that you came out. And for those of you that are online tuning in, however you decided to join us this morning, I'm just so happy that you're here. And if you're new to our church, we are currently studying through the Gospel of Matthew. And we've been taking it one section at a time. And that's brought us to this section that we're covering today, which is Matthew 20, verses 20 through 28 where Jesus is going to teach us about greatness through service, becoming great by modeling the life of Jesus. We're picking up in Matthew 20, 20, where we have learned that the disciples have been under the teaching, leading, and preaching of Jesus for almost three years now. And even with these years of devotion, the disciples seem to struggle at times to understand the heart of Jesus and to really listen to his words. Like us at times, they do became distracted or focused on what they want and what they thought Jesus should do. The disciples in our text today are desiring greatness. Can you relate? Have you ever desired to be great? To receive fame and praise of people Have you ever prayed for something so fervently and dreamed of exactly how and when and where God would most certainly answer your prayer request right down to the smallest detail only to find that he had something completely different in mind? I worked in higher education for 12 years and my experiences there in student life and resolving conflicts and event planning and overseeing residence life team, they were all supposed to lead to the coveted position, at least in my eyes, as the dean of students. That, to me, was going to be greatness. And I had been diligently working towards it. I had been praying for it. I had pretty much figured out exactly how it was going to happen, and I was ready for it. So any time now, God would be perfect. In the midst of all the planning and praying, God was doing something completely different, something new, something I wasn't explicitly praying for, yet exactly what I needed. It was just nothing to do with my plan or the title that I desired I selfishly desired to be great. In the world's eyes, in my eyes, in the eyes of my family and my parents. But God had to plan to humble me and to show me what true greatness is. It was a paradigm shift. It was a kingdom-minded shift. And I will get back to that story in just a few minutes of what really happened there. But I want to get into the scripture today And that's exactly where we're finding the disciples in the text today. In fact, it wasn't just them dreaming of being in a position of greatness. The two of them got their mother on board. Yeah, you heard me right. They got their mama, Alon, to ask Jesus on behalf of their sons about a position of greatness in God's kingdom. And you try telling a mom that their kids don't deserve the best. And that's exactly what Jesus was tasked to do. Today we're going to highlight four things in our text. The request, the reply, the reaction, and the response. And you know I had to keep the alliteration game strong, so they'd ask me to come speak from time to time. So here we go. Let's begin with the mother's request. Let's read together in verses 20 and 21. Then the mother mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him, Jesus, with her sons, which are two of the disciples, James and John, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. As it turns out, this request comes from the tail end of Mike's message that we talked about last week where Jesus foretells his death for a third time. And we have to remember that in the disciples' minds, when Messiah came, he would overthrow 
the powers of Rome and establish a worldwide kingdom of his own. And despite Jesus continually telling them of God's specific plan for him to be our sacrificial lamb, to face death at the hands of the Romans and to be raised to life on the third day, the disciples had their sights set on the future they were dreaming of. Throughout history, one of the most common tactics for getting ahead has been using the influence of family and friends to one's own advantage. Associations are used to gain political office, a promotion in business, a lucrative contract, or whatever else is craved. As the saying goes, it's who you know that counts. So collectively, the three of them may have been trying to capitalize on their relationship to Jesus. By comparing the gospel accounts of the women who were at the crucifixion of Jesus, it, became, it becomes evident that the mother of James and John was named Salomon and was the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, making her Jesus' aunt and James and John his first cousins. In addition to relying on their relationship as Jesus' cousins, the brothers perhaps also thought to play on Jesus' affection for his mother by having her sister approach him for the favor. The request of Jesus not only was bold, but brash. In effect, they were claiming that of all the great people of God who had ever lived, they deserved and desired to have the two highest places of honor beside the king of heaven. And like the scribes and the Pharisees who loved the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues, James and John longed for prestige and to be exalted over the other apostles. And they used their mother to ask such a request. Because like I said before, can anyone be more influential than a mother? Now that we've heard the request, we're going to note the next thing here, which is, the reply. So we see this in verses 22 and 23 where we read, but Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you are asking for. Are you able to drink the cup I am about to drink? They said to him, we are able. And he said to them, my cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. The cup that Jesus was about to drink was the cup of suffering and death. And he had, just, he had just finished describing that in verses 17 through 19 in this chapter. Jesus was saying, don't you realize by now the way to eternal glory is not through worldly success and honor, but through suffering. I believe James and John were trying to be courageous when saying they were willing to drink the same cup Jesus was about to take. We know that after Jesus' death, life treated James and John very differently. James was the first apostle to die as a martyr. For him, the cup was martyrdom. On the other hand, by far the greater weight of tradition goes to show that John lived to a great old age in Ephesus and died a natural death when he was about 100 years old. So for him, the cup was the constant discipline and struggle of the Christian life throughout the years after Jesus' death and resurrection. And as much as James and John's willingness to drink that same cup, I don't think they could truly comprehend what they were agreeing to. To drink the cup meant to drink the full measure, leaving nothing. It was a common expression that meant to stay with something to the end to endure to the limits, whatever the cost. The cup that Jesus was about to drink was immeasurably worse than the physical agony of the cross or the emotional anguish of being forsaken by his friends, painful as those were. The full measure of his cup was taking the world's sins upon himself, an agony so horrible that he prayed this in Matthew 26. He said, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. All right, now that we've seen the request and the reply, 
Let's note the next section as the reaction. Look with me to verse 24. And hearing this, the ten, the other disciples, became indignant with the two brothers. The response of the ten other disciples seems righteous on the surface, but they became indignant with the two brothers, not because of their own righteousness, because, but because of their envious resentment. They had in the past expressed the same proud and selfish sentiments. Like this, on the way from Caesarea uh, Philippi to Capernaum, they had discussed with one another which one of them would be the greatest, but were ashamed to admit that to Jesus when he asked. Even at the Last Supper, there arose a dispute among them as to which one of them would be regarded as greatest. They were all guilty of the same self-serving ambition that had just been uh, demonstrated by the two of the brothers. And the fact that Jesus' next words will be addressed to them all, all 12 of them, not to just to James and John, suggests that they all still clearly still suffer from the same concern for status. The anger of the other 10 is provoked rather by the fact that James and John have tried to pull a quick one on them. All of them would have looked forward to the most honorable places and they resent being elbowed out of the way by this ambitious pair. All right, we've seen the request, the reply, and the reaction. So let's lastly note the response. This is the last part of the, this section of scripture for today. And it, reads, it says this, But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great men exercise authority over them? It is, it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The rulers of the Gentiles lorded over their subjects, Jesus said. And virtually every government of that day was a form of dictatorship. The world seeks greatness through power epitomized by rulers of the Gentiles, such as the Pharaohs and the Caesars and the Herods and Pilate, under all of whom the Jews had suffered greatly. Though not as absolute or destructive as those, the same philosophy of dominance can be found in modern businesses and even some Christian organizations. Many people in high positions cannot resist the temptation to use their power of influence on others. Some are radical egomaniacs, whereas others are respectful and orthodox, but they share a common worldly desire to control others. And Jesus approved of neither the actions of the two or those of the ten. So he called them all together again to teach them once more that it is humility, not self-assertion, that is important in the kingdom. It means that those who take the lead among them are to be humble, not seeking personal success, but the opportunity of being an unpresuming servant. Jesus turned the world's greatness upside down. The self-serving, self-promoting, self-glorying ways of the world are the opposite of spiritual greatness. They have no place in God's kingdom and are not to be so among you. Jesus is the supreme example of humility and servanthood because as a sovereign of the universe in all of eternity, he subjected himself to humiliation and even to death. He is the most exalted because he faithfully endured the most humiliation. And although he was the king of kings and he had the right to be served by others, he ministered as a servant and gave his life to serve others. Now that we've walked our way through the text today, let's turn our attention to this all-important question. What is God calling us to do in light of what he said? 
When the mother of James and John came to Jesus to ask of her request, Jesus started with this, what is it that you want? So let me ask you that same question here today. What is it you want, to be great in the world's standards or by God's standards? What is it you want, the approval of the world or the approval of God? And what is it you want, the fleeting praise of man or the eternal praise of God? Well, the text informs us that God measures success differently than people and calls us to be humble servants, just like Jesus was. The cost of true greatness is humble, selfish, selfless, and sacrificial service. The Christian who desires to be great and first in the kingdom is the one who is willing to serve in the hard place, the uncomfortable place, the lonely place, the demanding place, the place where he is not appreciated and may even be persecuted. He who is willing to work for excellence without becoming proud, to withstand criticism without becoming bitter, to be misjudged without becoming defensive, and to withstand suffering without succumbing to self-pity. And in light of that, what can we do as believers to make sure we are living the true life of a Christian? Let me share with you today just three practical steps. Number one is this, serve in your home. <clears throat> Let's start with a verse from the Gospel of John. Speaking of Jesus, he wrote this. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, was washing the feet of his disciples. And remember, back then, they were open-toed sandals, all right? And they walked on paths that animals walked. So I can promise you, these were some pretty nasty feet that Jesus was washing. And yet, some of us aren't willing to even serve in our homes. And we can change that today. We could start doing the dishes, cleaning the toilets, changing a diaper, preparing a meal. And right now, I'm not necessarily talking to the single parent here. I know that you have to do all of those things. But maybe you have a team in your home that's here listening to this today. Or for those married couples, what I'm, what I'm challenging you to do right now is do something in your home, serve in a way that you don't already serve in. And watch and watch how that will change the atmosphere in your home. And you can see what greatness really is in the eyes of Jesus. And I know your spouse will appreciate it too. Listen to what Jesus said once he is done in verses 12 through 17 in John. When he had washed their feet and put, out his outer, put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. I don't think it's possible to have a more humbled servant than Jesus. He led the way in his home, so what better of a person for all of us to emulate than Jesus? All right, moving on to number two, serve in your church. Many of you already in this room today serve in many of the different ministries that we have at Noonday. In fact, we have over 400 people serving here at New Day, which based on our average adult attendance, that's about 45% of adults already serving. But that also makes that 55% of you aren't serving yet. But the good news is I have opportunities for you. We are just months away, as many of you know, from opening up our second location in Aguam. And our team, along with many of you, are working tirelessly to replace all of the open spots 
here in Enfield. But let me share with you a few specific departments where we still have some opportunities. On our host team, we need ushers to help people find a seat here in the auditorium. In our kids department, we could use more spark leaders teaching our tweens, kids church and registration volunteers. And right here on our worship team, we could use more keyboard players, acoustic guitarists, and drummers. Even outside of Sunday, we're looking for more youth ministry, small group leaders, church online hosts, and small group facilitators that are willing to open up their home in Connecticut. Let me ask, are any of these opportunities that I'm sharing with you striking a chord? This is where the rubber meets the road. We are in the, the weeds of greatness here, and you have an opportunity to step up and serve in a great way. Are you willing to serve sacrificially in the church? And if you are, it's really simple. You can use the Church Center app right on the home page. Right on there um, is joining the Dream Team. You can fill that out, and we would get you going. Even better, you could even head out to guest services, and they'll show you exactly what to do, because I know that they would love to meet you and get you onboarded to our Dream Team. Some of my favorite stories by far are people um, here that see a need, and they meet a need. Right? Sometimes these people are business owners with multi-million dollar budgets. Doctors, lawyers, nurses, police officers, and the list goes on and on for all the people that serve here. So when I see these people serving in our kids program, teaching the future generations about Jesus, or just making a simple cup of coffee, or greeting at the door, I can't stop and think what humble serv servants they are. I bet most of you here at New Day could easily say, do you know what I do for a living? The influence I have outside of these doors? But you don't. You just serve. You are being great in the eyes of Jesus, and we thank you so much for that. If serving on one of our teams just isn't workable for you right now, let me share with you just a few other ways that you could be a huge blessing to New Day. You could start attending first service. And I know many of you, maybe you tried it and you're back in second service and it's early, I know. But when you come to first service, you're opening up parking spots and seats here for first time guests. And you're like, I am sorry, I am not an early riser. All right, try third service, right? I know, I know I could do that, but you know, football starts, the Patriots are on. It's just the kickoff, all right? They're not even playing that good right now, right? It doesn't matter. Try third service for a little bit, right? And here's one other way you could do and serve in a way. It's parking at Calvary Church. So right across the street, we have over 50, 60 cars each and every Sunday of New Day people parking over at Calvary Church. And we run a shuttle the entire day from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. every Sunday to and from that lot down the road. And I tell you what, if we didn't have that lot right now to park those cars, it would be really hard to be having these services the way we'd have them. We'd have to have even more services than we already have, maybe even having to turn people away. So when we park our cars off campus, we are, we are making it easier for first-time guests to park on this lot to come in here, to hear God's word, maybe for the first time in their lives, maybe even get saved, and then have their eternal life changed forever just because we chose to park somewhere else. And lastly, you can serve in your community. Since we arrived in Enfield, Connecticut, we have made a huge impact in this community under the leadership of Tracy Jarvis, our outreach and missions pastor, we have partnered with local organizations that are already serving in this community. Let me list a few here of the organizations. The Enfield Food Shelf, Loaves and Fishes, the Enfield Safe Warming, Harbor Warming Center, the Crisis Response Team, and the Network for Domestic Violence. When we help them succeed, Enfield 
succeeds. And there is no limit to the amount of good that we can do here in this community. And we've already started to plant some of those same seeds in Agawam. We partnered with the Agawam Police Department for their uh, national night out. We also partnered with Agawam for the Harvest Festival. And we're already looking to partnership with adopting a school in the near future. And those happen to be like two locations that our churches are in, but that doesn't mean you can't serve in the community that you live in. And there are several opportunities in every single town. So what we got to do is go find out what's going on in your town. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can partner with the communities to keep the momentum going. And if you see an, a great opportunity in your town, we want to you to be the champion of the cause, but we want to come alongside of you and help you in your community. And you can do that by going to the Church Center app and right on that same homepage that we talked about, the Dream Team sign up, there's a Serve Your Circle tab. And if you fill it right towards the bottom, there's, um, you, know, you can submit a serving project for approval. And the whole idea with there would be that we could sign up and serve alongside of you in your community. The big message here for serving in our communities, especially in Enfield and Agawam, is that we want to make sure that if we ever had to leave, which we have no intentions of ever doing, but if we ever had to leave this community, that it would leave a town sad and disappointed that we had to leave, never wondering like, oh, I never knew that church even existed in this town. So we want to make that impact great in these communities. Jesus said, whoever wishes to become great among you, that is great by God's standards rather than men, shall be your servant. This kind of greatness is pleasing to God because it is humble and self-giving rather than proud and self-serving. The way to the world's greatness is through pleasing and being served by men. The way to God's greatness is through pleasing him and serving others in his name. As you can easily surmise from my opening story, no, I never became the dean of students because God's call in my life wasn't to achieve a great title or position at that college, but it was a call to full-time ministry to love and to serve others in the name of Jesus. And so he humbled me with a different plan that he had in mind for my life. In God's eyes, the one who is great is the one who is a willing, humble servant who is ready to step up and be great today. He finished this passage with this, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The unbeliever is a slave to sin, Satan and death. And it was to redeem men from those slaveries that Jesus gave his life as a ransom in exchange for sinners. Jesus' ultimate act of servanthood was to give his life Man was in the grip of a power of evil they could not break. Their sins dragged them down. Their sins separated them from God. Their sins wrecked life for themselves, for the world, and for God himself. A ransom is something paid or given to liberate a person from a situation from which it is impossible for them to free themselves Therefore, what this saying means is quite simply, it costs the life and death of Jesus Christ to bring man back to God. And if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to pray with you right here, right now, so that you can be liberated. So we're going to pray and wherever you are, here in the auditorium, maybe you're online, sitting on the couch, I want you to bow your head and I want to close, have you close your eyes. And not out loud, but in your heart, I want you to say something along these lines to God. Say, Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for being a humble servant. Your life on earth is a reminder to all of us on what it takes to be a believer. So thank you for this reminder today. I sit here in my seat today and humbly ask for your forgiveness that I know I don't deserve, but you have provided for me by dying on the cross for my sins. I know that in my own power, I can't do any of this on my own, so today I humbly ask for your help. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, and thank you for loving me, even though I may not always deserve it. And I pray all of this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, if you just prayed that prayer along with me, congratulations. Best decision you're ever going to make. Yep, absolutely. Give them a round of applause. You just became a citizen of heaven where you get to spend eternity with Christ who has set you free. But we want to make sure that before you leave today, we get a Bible into your hands. And the way you can do that is that there's a welcome card that we were talking about at the beginning of service. And if you take out that welcome card and put in your contact information in the top, and then you check off that box that says, I've decided to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. And you bring that out to guest services. Our team there would love to hand you a Bible, congratulate you, and get you going on that journey. For those of you that are online, there's a QR code coming up on the screen to that same form. Fill that out, submit it, and we will mail you that same Bible. For those of you that are first-time guests, we don't want to forget about you. We are so glad that you decided to join us today. Take that same welcome card with you out to guest services and exchange that for a gift. And again, that's just our way of saying thank you for being a part of our church today. That's all I have for today. Thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful week. God bless. Thanks for experiencing this message with us. Do you want more New Day Church in your life? Well, please like and subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Want to take a next step in your faith? Our Church Center app is the best place to get more connected. So just download the free app on your app store today and be sure to choose New Day Church in Enfield, Connecticut. We are able to offer this sermon and all others like it only because of your faithful financial support. Thank you to all of you who so faithfully give each week. If you feel led to support our ministry financially, just go to our website at newdaychurch.cc forward slash give. Thank you in advance. May God richly bless you and we hope to see you again real soon.